Our next speaker is uh, Alessandro. So Alessandro is a senior researcher at Silence, uh, working on deep learning acceleration, and he will talk about the quantization today. And uh, he has a uh, pre-recorded video, and I will play that. And he is also online, and uh, he can uh, answer questions on chat while the video is playing. So uh, feel free to ask him any questions uh, in the chat if you have. Uh, let me share the uh, his video. Hi everyone, this is Alessandro from Silence Research Labs and today I'm going to be talking about a PyTorch library for neural network quantization called Brevitas I've been working on for a while. So just to set the agenda, first I'm going to give a brief overview of different approaches to neural network quantization and then I'm going to talk about what is, what is Brevitas and what it does. I'm going to show various uh, code examples in a Jupyter notebook, uh, and then finally I'm going to draw some uh, conclusions and mention future work. So uh, this tutorial is going to be focused mostly on uh, quantization aware training, uh, even though Brevitas can also do other styles of quantization. And in order to get into the more interesting details, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to assume some familiarity with uh, uh, quantization in the context of neural networks, as well as uh, general understanding. Of how PyTorch works. So this is a representation of how quantization is applied uh, usually in the context of uh, post-training quantization. We typically perform uh, training first in a floating point and it might involve some uh, degree of design space exploration over our uh, topology. We then get a model with some uh, uh, quality metric and we deploy it through a tool chain, for example, TVM, that uh, um, performs a post-training quantization by means of uh, some calibration data, and that can involve also a separate uh, design space exploration process to try to approximate as much as possible the original quality of results by uh, deciding which layers uh, to quantize and how to quantize them. And finally, we perform uh, inference. In the quantization aware training scenario instead, we couple training and quantization in the same step. And the idea then is that we can perform design space exploration over all the usual dimensions that you might, you might be interested in a training time, as well as the data types that are going to be adopted at inference time. And uh, this usually happens by uh, through a quantization aware training uh, library uh, like uh, Brevitas, and uh, uh, it makes sense whenever a target device uh, is already being envisioned uh, at training time. And so again, to compare with post-training quantization, we have uh, limited computational requirements, uh, but because training and quantization are decoupled, it's uh, very difficult to extend below eight it's, and in general, there is much space for training time co-design, while with uh, quantization aware training, while it is more computation expensive, it allows to perform uh, training time uh, co-design down to uh, binary weights and activations. <laughs> Previtas is a PyTorch library that uh, uh, realizes uh, the quantization aware training scenario that we see before, in particular, it's focused on uh, uniform affine uh, quantization and on uh, modeling a uh, reduced precision data path at training time. Uh, it tries to empower both uh, beginners with a uh, good choice of uh, defaults, as well as uh, more advanced users with uh, uh, complex requirements uh, over what they want to quantize and how they want to quantize. Uh, with Brevitas, it's possible to model a variety of uh, different hardware backends uh, to perform a co-design over, but it's also possible to reason about uh, potential future accelerators that don't exist yet, or uh, to perform co-design over uh, programmable hardware like uh, FPGAs. Yeah. 
Brevitas exposes a variety of different quantization algorithms under the idea that no single approach is necessarily the best and quantization algorithms should be treated as any other hyperparameter. And uh, in general, Brevitas is designed you know, to be extended in multiple directions, both in terms of how quantization is performed as well as uh, the different backends that are targeted. So in terms of uh, features, uh, everything is, uh, uh, almost everything is written in either uh, uh, Python or uh, Torch script, a subset of Python that uh, PyTorch is capable of uh, just in time compiling. We provide a large library of uh, composable building blocks that can be assembled at different levels of, of abstraction to model different style of uh, uh, accelerators and quantization algorithms. And we try to integrate um, tightly with PyTorch uh, by being as uh, eager more friendly as, as we can and by uh, adopting the so-called fake quantization approach, meaning that the quantized tensor in Brevitas are represented in the quantized format. And so they can be easily uh, mixed with the standard uh, torch operators and they can leverage uh, all the existing um, Accelerate the training time that, that PyTorch provides. And finally, to integrate with different uh, tool chains, we leverage PyTorch support for custom symbolic representation by exporting mainly to different variants of the OLEX format. And so just to give an example, here I'm showing uh, two families of models, the MobileNet uh, Edge TPU and EfficientNet Edge, uh, quantized to 8-bit with the post-training quantization using uh, TensorFlow, compared to uh, one of them, so EfficientNet Edge uh, small, quantized to 4-bit weights and activation with uh, uh, Brevitas and quantization over training. And this is a um, top one error on the image net validation set over the model size. And as you can see, by switching to uh, lower precision data type with quantization aware training, we can extract uh, much more uh, efficiency even from a model that is already quite efficient. One of the core features of Previtas is the concept of a quant tensor, which is a structure to represent a quantized tensor in the quantized format, where the following invariants hold the, the quantized tensor divided by the scale plus the zero point has to be an integer that can be represented within the bit width specified by the tensor with different boundaries, depending on whether the uh, tensor is assigned or unsigned. Then going uh, bottom up, uh, Previtas provides a variety of building blocks that can be used to assemble different uh, quantization algorithms by specifying different ways, for example, to compute uh, scale factors or to compute zero point or to compute uh, precision so they can be you know, learned or they can be compared various power values, per channel, per tensor, and so on. And as well as uh, more specific stuff like uh, uh, you know different type of rounding where they should be round to nearest or something else, and uh, properties like whether it should be in a row range or not. All these uh, components then can be assembled together into a quantizer, which represents uh, a self-contained uh, particular quantization algorithm that specifies all its uh, parameters. And uh, the idea is that uh, uh, users can either leverage existing quantizers or customize them by uh, you know, modifying certain aspects of them or write new quantizers to implement complete new quantization algorithm from scratch as long as they return a quantizer. And once we have a quantizer, then we can apply it uh, to a quantized layer, meaning that a quantized layer accepts uh, quantizers for different parts of itself, like weights, biases, input, outputs, and so on. And in general, a quantized layer can uh, accept and or generate a 
quantized tensor as uh, uh, input or output. I'm going to give now an overview of how Gravitas works and uh, different things that you can do with it. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to be able to cover everything in detail. So anyone that is interested can check out the notebook also offline. So we're going to start by looking at the quant linear, which is a typical quantized layer. And as we can see, by default, uh, it sets a weight quantizer, uh, but not a bias input or output quantizer. And quant linear works in a similar way to other layers like quant comp 1D or quant comp transpose and so on. So what happens by default with weight quantization is that we are doing uh, eight bit uh, signed uh, integer quantization with upper tensor floating point scale factor and non zero point. And we're doing it by setting this uh, weight quantizer. So we can see indeed that that's the case by inspecting a uh, quant linear layer and looking at its original weight tensor compared to its quantized weight tensor. As as you can see, the uh, quantized weight tensor is represented as a quant tensor, which carries all the metadata that we've uh, mentioned, as well as uh, um, a flag to indicate whether the tensor has been generated in training mode or inference mode, which is going to be relevant in various scenarios, as we're going to see soon. By default, the default scale factor is differentiable, and we can see it uh, here since it it exposes a grad function and it's computed based on the maximum absolute value found within the full precision weight test. We can do things like retrieving the corresponding integer representation. And in general, obviously, uh, whenever we're doing only weight quantization, but using a floating point input, the output of this layer is also going to be floating point. The way that it works underneath is by taking advantage of standard um, PyTorch APIs, in this case, the functional linear operator that is computing the linear operation between the uh, floating point input and the uh, quantized tensor in the quantized format. It's also possible to switch to other quantizer, like a fixed point with quantizer, for example that restricts the scale to a power of two, and we can verify that that's indeed the case. Or for example, um, binary weight quantizer with, in this case, a constant scale factor that is uh, by default point 0.1, which as we can see is not differentiable, and uh, generates a binary weight tensor. It's also possible to share weight quantizers among uh, different layers, in the sense of uh, uh, making sure that even when the quantizer has some learned components, uh, those learned components are shared among all the um, layers that the uh, quantizer is being shared to. And this works in a nigger friendly mode, meaning that we don't need to set in advance the number of layers it's going to be shared to. So, for example, we can just define uh, quant linear layer one, and then take its quantizer and set it as the quantizer of a quant linear layer two. And uh, um, the way that Previtas works is such that once the quantizer is shared among multiple layers, it's reinitialized, and uh, attributes like the scale factor are recomputed to account for the fact that now it's shared. And in this particular case, it means that now the uh, maximum value that is used to compute the scale factor is uh, computed among all the weight tensors that participate uh, in the quantizer. And as we can see, then it's being updated uh, after the quantizer is shared. We can also um, perform uh, input, output, or general activation quantization by a set setting appropriate quantizer. So, for example, here we are using this. Uh, um, signed intake uh, uh, quantizer with per tensor floating point scale factor, and again, no zero point, which is what happens by default in uh, Previtas. And uh, uh, as we can see by default, uh, the output tensor that is uh, resulting uh, of uh, out of this uh, 
operation where basically we are uh, we have a quant linear layer with input quantization and wave quantization enabled is still uh, um, represented let's say implicitly as a, a standard flow test so we can uh, represent it as a proper quant tensor by setting the flag uh, return quant tensor equal uh, true and as we can see it's it now the layer now returns the uh, tensor data with all the metadata we are interested in. Uh, instead of setting uh, an input quantizer within the quant linear layer, we could have also instantiated a separate layer like uh, a quant identity, which by default adopts the quantizer uh, we have just seen. And uh, we would get the same result as before, just with uh, basically a different uh, syntax and different way to organize the code. The difference between instantiating a separate layer or setting a quantizer as part of a layer like uh, as the input quantizer of a quant linear resides in the fact that uh, other, you know, that for let's say stylistic reason, uh, some export flow might assume that uh, certain quantizers are defined as part of a layer. For example, the standard onyx offset assumes that linear layers always define an output quantizer. For an activation like uh, quant relu, the default quantizer is instead unsigned to take advantage of the fact that relu uh, generates always um, positive numbers. And in particular, for quantize activation like quant relu, uh, by default, quantization is applied at the output, meaning we first compute the relu and then we quantize it. And this is what happens in this example here. It's also possible to requantize a tensor, meaning to pass a quant tensor to a quantize activation. And for example, that's what we're doing here by passing a, a tensor first through a quant identity and then through a quant relu. And as you can see, a uh, new scale factor is computed to take into account the fact that the interval after the relu now it has follows a different distribution. So just as a note, in order to minimize, uh, let's say, user interaction and make things easier for beginners, uh, by default, activation quantizers uh, go through a um, statistic collection phase that looks at the uh, percentile of the absolute value of the data for a certain number of steps, by default, 300 to compute uh, an initialization value for uh, a parameter that then is learned. And so we have that during the statistic collection phase, uh, the layer behaves sort of like a batch norm. When in training mode, we collect statistics and we accumulate them in exponential moving average uh, while returning uh, the statistics for uh, that particular uh, tensor that is being passed as input. And evaluation mode, instead, we return uh, the scale factor based on the um, exponential moving average that has been accumulated so far. And then after the statistic collection phase is completed, uh, the learned parameter is used to compute the scale factor in both training and eval mode. And this can be seen as a sort of uh, initial uh, calibration step, uh, although uh, it happens with quantization enabled, which is not what you would normally do. Uh, during, uh, for example, calibration-based quantization. Uh, regarding uh, bias quantization, what happens in many pool chains is that bias is typically quantized with a scale factor equal to the input scale multiplied by the weight scale. In order to do so in brevitas, what we do is set then a quantizer like this one in 16 bias, which uh, uh, requires to pass in uh, um, quantized input. So if we didn't pass in any quantized input, like in this case, we would then get uh, an error, as I'm showing here, uh, which we can solve by either passing in a quant tensor coming, for example, from a, a previous layer as input, or by setting an input quantizer, like I'm doing here. It's possible also to perform operation on a quantized tensor, for example, element-wise arithmetic, which is very relevant to you know, uh, performing uh, residual uh, in a residual topologies. And uh, uh, the, the most important thing to note there is that in line with traditional fixed point arithmetic, uh, element-wise addition requires the scale of the operands to be the same. 
in order to make sure though that this works well with the way that uh, uh, activation are um, quantized by default, this restriction is enforced only in evaluation mode, but not in training mode. And this is why also quant tensor that carry a training flag. An easy way to make sure that two tensors have the same scale factor is to simply quantize them with the same quant identity, as I'm shown here in this example. And thanks to that, then we can make sure that uh, the input operands to another have the same scale and can result in an output tensor with the same scale and just an increased width. It's also possible to call a standard uh, torch functions on quantized tensor and depending whether the operation being computed is invariant to quantization or not, uh, we're going to get uh, a quant tensor or uh, a standard uh, torch tensor as output. And with the invariant to quantization, what I mean is that the output of the function applied to the dequantized value should still be a quantized value with the same scale 0 point and uh, bit width. So for example, max pool is one of those operations that are invariant to quantization, and so it generates a quant tensor, while an operation like tanh uh, is not, and so it generates a standard torch tensor. Finally, another operation that is relevant uh, is to residual topology is concatenation, which similarly to additions requires that the input tensor are quantized with the same sign scale at zero point and bit width. And again, when it comes to scale and zero point, uh, they are allowed to be different in training mode, but they have to be the same in inference mode. And uh, as you can see, then um, this is how it works. Let's look now at how we can uh, customize some of the quantizers we've seen so far. So the easiest way to do so is by simply passing appropriate keyword arguments to uh, quantized uh, layers whenever a quantizer is set. And the simplest thing we can do, uh, for example, is to set the bit width of uh, weights. In this case, we're setting bit width five, and we can see it's reflected in the uh, weight uh, quantizer. We can also enable uh, per channel quantization by setting this flag. And as we can see, then uh, we're going to now get uh, a scale that is uh, a tensor and it's still uh, differentiable. So everything we set so far still applies. And we can also do the same things for activation. So, for example, again, setting the precision of uh, our quant identity. In this example, we're setting it with uh, equal to three. Or uh, in other uh, scenarios, it's also possible to um, pass in required arguments to certain quantizers, so something that quantizer actually expects from a user. For example, in this case, we're using uh, this quantizer, which requires to specify a maximum value that is used to initialize the internal uh, learned scale factor. So in this scenario, then we are simulating uh, quantized uh, ReU6 with the alert uh, scale factor. And you can see this, um, this scenario as an alternative to using the default quantizer that instead collect uh, statistics in order to determine this uh, uh, maximum value. It's also possible to perform uh, per channel activation quantization as long as the number of channels is statically defined by providing some extra information. And this makes sense, for example, uh, as uh, quantized input to a depth-wise separable layer, like a depth-wise separable convolution, so that the rules of arithmetic that we have defined so far of making sure that uh, only things with the same scale factor are summed together are not violated. And so what we're doing here is uh, first setting an input quantizer, we're also setting bias quantizer, and then setting various keyword arguments to specify how we want our uh, per channel quantization to happen. And we have to specify information on uh, how the input tensor should be permuted such that the channel dimension comes first and what should be the shape of the underlying learned parameter that is going to be initialized uh, after the statistics collection phase is over. And as we can see, indeed, our output tensor for this stepwise separable uh, uh, convolution is a quantized tensor with uh, 
uh, per channel scaling. Uh, instead of, though, of going through this kind of verbose process of setting out of keyword arguments, we can also define a new quantizer by uh, inheriting from the existing one, since a quantizer is a class. And in this example, I'm uh, redoing exactly what we did in the previous one of uh, performing per uh, tensor, I'm sorry, per channel input quantization. But uh, we are defining first a new quantizer that is setting some common properties. And then we're setting as keyword argument only uh, the shape of the learned parameter, which is specific to this particular layer. So this is a way, let's say, to organize your code uh, in a more modular uh, fashion so that anything that is uh, shared among uh, uh, multiple um, quantizers can be put in a separate uh, standalone class. In general, then, let's now uh, look at how a quantizer is defined from scratch. This is not the only way uh, to define a quantizer, but it's definitely the uh, easiest one and which is to just uh, inherit from this uh, class called the weight quant solver for weights and set a variety of uh, property uh, to some uh, enums uh, that specify different aspects of our quantization algorithm that are then internally translated to this uh, solver uh, to um, a particular implementation that makes sense in this case for weight quantization. So as you can see here, we are redefining uh, the weight quantizer we've seen so far with this uh, uh, interface, and we are specifying different uh, properties of it. So we're saying that it's an integer quantizer with a constant uh, bit bit and around to uh, nearest uh, uh, even uh, with uh, obviously a straight two estimator. Uh, we are using statistics to perform uh, um, computer scale factor, and those statistics are based on the maximum value of the absolute value of the weight tensor. We are restricting the um, scale factor to a floating point value, so really no restriction, but it could have also been, for example, a power of two number for fixed point quantization. And we're doing uh, uh, per tensor quantization at 8 bit that is signed and not narrow range, meaning that, uh, sorry, and uh, it is a narrow range, meaning that we are getting rid of one value uh, on the left side, let's say, and we're using uh, uh, zero as our zero point. So in this case, uh, we don't have an interface for it yet. We can do similar thing for activation quantization just by inheriting from uh, now act quant solver and setting the same enums. In this case, though, for this particular quantizer, they're slightly different, uh, um, as in. Uh, we are now do, defining, as we've seen so far, a parameter that is initialized based on statistics. And for this quantizer that we've seen so far, that statistics is the percentile, and it's the 99.999 uh, for 300 step. And everything else is the same as in the weight quantizer above, except here we are not doing narrow range quantization. So any uh, attribute of our quantizer can be defined either as part of the quantizer class itself uh, or by uh, overriding it as a keyword argument by passing also the appropriate prefix to specify which quantizer should be overridden. In this way, we can you know, try to find a balance in the way that our code is organized. Uh, and so let's now look at a more advanced example of um, quantizer with, uh, uh, in this case, uh, per channel uh, quantization. And uh, uh, this is a weight quantizer, so by the way. Um, learned uh, uh, scale factor that is initialized from uh, statistics, and statistics is still the max since we're not uh, changing that. It's learned uh, though in log domain, so by restricting the scale factor to log FP, which sometimes can help with uh, convergence. And we're also setting the bit width as a learned parameter, which is something that you can do as the literature has shown, and which is also supported in uh, practice. And as we can see now, uh, both our uh, scale factor and our bit width expose a ground uh, function because they're both learned values. And you can imagine that by having the bit width as a learned value, you can also use it as part of a function to try to uh, steer convergence in a direction that, for example, uh, 
penalizes more the bit of larger layers. The same principles can also be applied to activations, and we can also combine the two things uh, and the sense of uh, passing, uh, having say uh, an input quantizer, the one that we just defined, and the weight quantizer, the one that we defined previously with learn scale and bit width. And as we can see, the output uh, bit width of a tensor that comes out of this layer uh, is still uh, a low value. And again, we can imagine that we could include it as part of a loss function, for example, to directly penalize the size of the output accumulator of this particular layer. It's also possible to um, retrain from a floating point. This is a very common scenario with quantization over training and usually just helps in you know, speeding up convergence. And um, we can simulate it by simply allocating a separate, uh, in this example, uh, floating point linear layer and then taking the, its uh, state dictionary as the uh, state dictionary to load for our quantized linear layer. If we didn't do anything else, though, we would get an error because, as we said, these quantized layers, which is using the quantizers we have just seen, has both learned the uh, scale factor and learned the uh, bit width, which are not present in the uh, state dictionary of the original uh, floating point layer. So we can set uh, uh, either environmental variable or uh, configuration flag at runtime to uh, ignore those error and make sure that we can uh, properly perform our quantization uh, and sorry, our retraining. The other important thing to notice is that uh, thanks to the way that Previtas works, whenever you are uh, loading a state tick on top of a quantized layer, the weight quantizer is uh, uh, reloaded and uh, recomputed appropriately. And in this scenario, it makes sense because uh, uh, we're saying that we want the scale to be alert parameter that is computed based uh, on the maximum value. However, we're first defining the layer and then uh, loading the state dictionary on top of it. So if Previtas didn't work the way it does, we would find ourselves with a scale factor that doesn't reflect the new maximum value of the weight tensor that has been loaded with the state dictionary. Uh, um, thanks to the way that Previtas is designed, uh, this is not a problem. And the reinitialization of the weight quantizer happens automatically. And the parameter is now alert. The parameter now takes into account as uh, initialization value, the new maximum value of the weight tensor to quantize. And we can see in this example that that's indeed the case. I want to mention now for a second, even though we don't have time to go to the details, that uh, it's also possible uh, in Brevitas to implement novel, completely custom uh, quantization algorithm based on externally defined uh, components, as long as the overall implementation returns a, a quant tensor. And if you're interested in doing so, I suggest you to go through this portion of the notebook offline. I'm just gonna mention the fact that uh, um, the way that it works basically is by leveraging an auto wiring dependency injection library called uh, dependencies that basically takes uh, in all the different uh, components that uh, in, in this in particular case, they are uh, always PyTorch modules that compose a quantization algorithm, put them together automatically, and make sure that whenever the quantizer needs to be um, reinitialized because of scenarios it seems so far, like whenever it's shared among multiple layers, whenever a state dictionary is, um, is loaded on top of it, 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 can, uh, it can do so in a very general fashion by taking advantage, uh, again, of uh, uh, auto wire independency injection. Additionally, in with the, at least with the built-in uh, components that are provided as part of Revitas, like the ones that you are seeing here that compose the 
uh, in case activation what else have we seen so far everything is also uh, end to end uh, compiled in uh, um, by pytorch uh, just in time compiler as long as we're setting the flag bracket as uh, g equal to 1 so that the let's say the overhead of having this uh, high degree of modularity is a bit reduced by taking advantage of the fuser uh, that is part of the just in time compiler and thanks to this mechanism we can also uh, do things like mm, defining a quantizer that depends on the uh, layer to quantize and uh, whose property are evaluated at dependency injection time for example in this case we are saying that our uh, initialization value for the scale factor is based on statistics of the layer to quantize and uh, as we've seen before this value is uh, uh, recomputed any time the um, quantizer is for example shared among multiple layers so thanks to the way then that the quantizer um, works in brevitas we can also do more sophisticated things by taking advantage of uh, how dependency injection work and for example in this scenario what we're doing is uh, sharing the same uh, instance of learned bitwid among uh, two completely different layers so our quantized identity and our quantized layer. so what we want to happen is that we want a learned uh, bitwid for both layers that converge to the same value and that makes sense uh, whenever, for example, in your hardware target, you have multipliers that uh, operates only among uh, uh, tensors of the same input. And finally, I would like to mention uh, uh, a few things around how export works. So in general, Brevitas doesn't perform any kind of acceleration on its own. To do so, our model first has to be exported to some uh, um, inference backend. And the way this uh, ecosystem uh, works is that uh, different backends uh, make different assumptions around how uh, quantization should be represented and what can be accelerated. So in general, you're going to have that different export flow supports different combination of quantizers and uh, uh, quantized layers. So, uh, in the next example, I'm going to use uh, the Netron library to visualize how the same layer is exported under different export flows or so variations of it. So, for example, here we are defining a uh, uh, comp 1D with uh, uh, 4 bit weights and 8 bit uh, sign symmetric input and output quantizer and a 16 bit uh, bias. And we're exporting it to the standard ONX uh, quantized offset, meaning that uh, as output we are generating a Q linear uh, uh, combo operation that contains uh, all the um, information related to how the uh, input weights and output are quantized. The disadvantage of this representation is that it actually doesn't scale below 8 bits. So for example, here the information on the fact that weights are 4 bits is, uh, is lost. And similarly for bias, they are represented at, uh, as 32 bit. And additionally, it also assumes that uh, um, an output quantizer is set uh, as part uh, of the layer itself, which, uh, you know, doesn't have to be the case. For example, if we're interested in representing, uh, say, a higher precision accumulator for uh, residual up, uh, you can do that in this format. So there's a different style of representation that's become more popular recently, which uh, uh, uses only quantized linear and dequantized linear operators, that, which are part of the Onyx offset, uh, to represent quantization. And it's not supported in Brevitas yet, but even with that, the support is still limited to 8 bit quantization. So to go around this restriction, then Brevitas implements its own uh, uh, custom uh, Onyx uh, um, quantization nodes to represent all the different uh, quantization uh, um, parameters we've seen uh, so far. And they're captured simply with a single quant node that represents, uh, uh, let's say, the fake quantization uh, operator and uh, um, captures the you know, various properties we've seen so far, the tensor to quantize, and then 
uh, scale, the zero point, and the, the solid fairly general. And it can be used, for example, as part of uh, the naming onyx based uh, tool chain that uh, adds a support to it. Um, so, for example, it could be used as a starting point for integration with PPM. With this presentation, then, uh, similarly to what happens with the QVQ format, we can also uh, represent scenario where, for example, we're doing long weight quantization, like in, in this case I'm showing here. It's also possible to export to other uh, backends, like uh, the Torch script. Uh, quantization backend, which comes with its own set of uh, restrictions. I'm not going to get into too many details, but it's worth mentioning that it's uh, um, there. And again, it doesn't scale to uh, reduce precision uh, in any way, or it's also possible to export one of our uh, Xilinx uh, tool chains. So, for example, here we are exporting uh, a fixed point to point conf 2 d to PyXIR, which is uh, an inference tool chains that accept a custom uh, Onyx dialect that is specific to 8-bit uh, fixed point quantization. And you can uh, generate that from Revitas. Finally, sorry, I want to mention another couple of things that I think are relevant, even though they're not uh, part of this tutorial. The first one is that uh, so far, we have seen a scenario in which we incorporate uh, quantization, let's say, by hand as part of the design of a neural network. However, there are many cases where it would be convenient to start with a model with floating point layers and then programmatically replace them with uh, uh, quantized layers according to some part of the term. One way to do so is by leveraging the newly introduced uh, FX subsystem for uh, uh, graph representation of neural network PyTorch. And uh, it works really well uh, with Previtas to the point that Previtas actually implements its own backport of PyTorch FX to make it work also with all the version of PyTorch, as well as its own uh, input driven uh, uh, tracer, which uh, is capable of generating a uh, uh, graph. Uh, even when uh, uh, tracing through conditional and unpacking operators by, uh, you know, at the cost of assuming that the uh, model is not uh, conditional on properties of the And we also implement various tra graph transformation under Revitas graph that can be used to build your own, uh, let's say, graph quantization front end on top of Revitas, and we, and we do so internally. It's also possible to perform a calibration-based post-training quantization, even though it's not necessarily what Previtas was originally designed around, but it can be useful either on its own, for example, combined with uh, graph quantization with effects, or as uh, an intermediate step between floating point training and the quantization of every train. And the way it works is fairly general in the sense that, by definition, uh, the way that calibration based post training quantization works is by computing some uh, statistics of the uh, weights and activation uh, passing through a floating point model to quantize. So, because um, all we've seen, as we've seen, various uh, previous quantizers are based on the uh, computing statistics along the forward pass, it doesn't really take much then to perform a proper uh, calibration. We just need a model that defines uh, layers uh, with uh, quantization based on, uh, on statistics, like the one we've seen so far um, for, you know, weights and activations, uh, with uh, uh, pre-trained uh, uh, floating point weights on top of it with the mechanism that we've seen uh, previously. Uh, then the only thing that we need to do really is to basically temporarily disable quantization while still statistics are being collected, uh, while uh, uh, you know, input data passes through our quantize uh, model to make sure that indeed we are capturing the uh, behavior of the uh, floating point model that we want to quantize. And this happens in uh, training mode, because as we've seen that uh, these activation uh, statistics are collected in training mode, then we can just put the model in uh, evaluation mode to use those statistics. Uh, 
have a quantization renewable again and perform a bias correction, which is a very common procedure to correct for the error um, introduced by quantization at the level of biases. And again, this happens in a fairly general way by just using books internally. And finally, we can just apply this function to the model to say that we want to finalize our collected statistics so that potentially we, we can also continue with uh, um, quantization of our training. And uh, that's all from me. So let's go back to the slides now. So to wrap up, we presented Previtas, a PyTorch library for neural network quantization focused on quantization of training. It's available on PyPI, so it can be installed with PIP. And so far, it has over 100,000 downloads, thanks to the fact that I think there are a few people using it, doing a very large scale distributed training. And you can find more details on uh, GitHub as our repository, as well as the notebook that I just presented. So in terms of future work, uh, I'm interested in enabling more automation, as I mentioned, through integration with the PyTorch FX, but also tighter integration with both the TDM and the MLIR ecosystem, since Alex is uh, uh, quite invested in both of them. Uh, and it would also be interesting to explore uh, styles of quantization beyond uh, usual used informal files, so things like uh, block floating point. And finally, uh, I'm also considering exploring uh, uh, doing uh, quantization aware training acceleration by moving beyond the usual uh, fake quantization approach. And that's all from me. Thanks for uh, tuning in.